grasses were still, the air hot, didn't stir, but the edge of the cloud came across the sky faster than the wind. The hair stood up on Jack's neck, and all at once he made a frightful sound up at the cloud, a growl and a whine, plunk. Something hit Laura's head and fell to the ground. She looked down and saw the largest grasshopper she had ever seen. The cloud was hailing grasshoppers. Their bodies hid the sun and made darkness. Their thin, large wings gleamed and glittered. The rasping, whirring of their wings filled the whole air, and they hit the ground in the house with the noise of a hailstorm. Fact or fiction? The story is based on the reality of many in the Midwest. In 1874, through Kansas and present day Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas, grasshoppers, literally, literally the, technically, the Rocky Mountain locusts, invaded the Great Plains. An estimated 12.5 trillion, 12.5 trillion in a 200,000 square mile area took over, leaving devastation and starvation for years to follow. One account states that farmers cinched their pants with string and ran to cover their wells. In many cases, their drinking water was about the only thing that they could save. As swarms landed on houses and fields and trees, the skies cleared. But then the real devastation began. The locusts soon ate the fields of crops, the leaves of trees, every blade of grass, the wool off sheep, the harnesses off horses, the paint off wagons, the handles off pitchforks. They washed in waves against the fences, piling a foot or more deep. They feasted for days, even devouring clothes and quilts placed on vegetable gardens. The farmers quipped, they ate everything but the mortgage. This is a picture, you get this? This is a, a cartoon from 1874, 1870s, around Topeka, Kansas, depicting the devastation of these locusts that hit in biblical proportions. This is a plague not too far from here, not too long ago. It's a plague similar to the one that we're going to talk about in Exodus, one of the three plagues we're going to talk about today. Here at Sawyer, we have a tradition to stand in honor of God's word. We're reading a larger portion of scripture. I'm going to be reading at different times. So we're not going to stand. But let me encourage you. We can honor God's word in a variety of ways. Would you honor God's word this morning by listening to what God would have to say to you, what he would say to you through his word? We believe God speaks today, and he speaks through his word. Would you listen to his word? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. You are our, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I was in a church one day, and the pastor was preaching, and he asked people in the congregation if there would be some volunteers to pray for him, pray for the congregation. Would anyone volunteer to pray? Raise your hand to pray for me as I speak. Okay, I got a couple there. Just pray for me that I would speak. This is not a speech. This is just explaining God's word. Pray for our hearts to be open and receptive to hear what God would have, have us do, would have us think, would have us speak. Today we have three plagues. The plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, the plague of death. If you remember, the Israelites have been living in Egypt for some 430 years. They're growing in number. They've grown in number, so much so that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, it says this. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities of Python and Ramesses. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. The more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made them people, the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. You probably remember early on in Exodus, the Pharaoh made an edict. He made a decree to slaughter all Israelite baby boys. And with a touch of irony, Moses escapes this 
this death sentence and grows up within the, fa- the Pharaoh's court, within the Pharaoh's own family. Aware of his Israelite heritage, Moses, at the sight of a taskmaster abusing an Israelite slave, kills, murders that taskmaster. With a fear of reprisal, he flees. At the age of 40, he joins a nomadic tribe in the wilderness, marries, has some kids, and he spends the next 40 years in the desert. At the age of 80, when most would sit back, enjoy their families and grandkids, maybe have a drink at the beach, God appears, and God gives Moses a mission, a mission impossible. Go back. Go back to Egypt. Stand up to that Pharaoh, to new Pharaoh. Perform signs and wonders that he may know I am God, and that I may free my people from their bondage. What does Moses do? He objects, and objects, and objects, and God would hear none of it. God puts Moses in his place. Moses is God's voice. Moses is God's choice. Moses is God's agent of the day. Chapter 6, verse 1 says this. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out. With a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God will do exactly what he wants. He will do exactly what he says. And unlike our weathermen and stock analysts who get the future right some of the time, God gets the future right all the time. He knows everything. He knows every grain of sand that's in your vehicles, every grain of sand that enters your shoes. He knows it all. So in obedience, what does Moses do? He goes with his older brother and approaches Pharaoh, changing a staff into a snake, demonstrating the almighty power of God. God can take an inanimate object and make it alive. He can instantly transform a stick into a different molecular and biological structure and just as quickly turn it back. God is like no other. Moses' God is king over the land and the sea, over the storms and sky, over reptiles and insects, the animals. He's He's God over health and sickness. And that's exactly what God demonstrates in the plagues, the seven previous plagues we've already discussed, with the plague of the Nile changing into blood for seven days, the plague of frogs and gnats and flies, killing and devastating the livestock, sending boils and hail. God is not not only able to predict these future traumas, but these amazing curses, but tell when they will happen, to start them and to stop them on a dime. Even the parameters, the geographic boundaries where these hit Egypt, he's in control of. You may remember that the Israelites lived in an area called Goshen. They were exempt from this trauma. God is doing something historic. He's doing something dynamic. He's doing something dramatic. This morning, I want to break our text into three sections. Three sections, chapter 10 and 11, into our thinking, our speaking, and doing. This is how it relates to us. Our thinking and speaking and doing. Right now, I want to think about our thinking. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to look at chapter 10, verse 1. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. We'll have it on the overhead as well. You have pew Bibles here. Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. The Lord said, then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor grandfathers have seen from the day they came on the earth to this day. Then he turned and went out for Pharaoh. Archaeologists have found 
this depiction in Egypt from around the time that this is written. It's pronounced Horaheb. Do we have it? Okay. They basically have a number of different, a number of different depictions of what looks like grasshoppers, large grasshoppers, grasshoppers on steroids. In 2013, there was some 30 million grasshoppers that hit Egypt. 30 million grasshoppers. That's a lot. But look at verse 14 of chapter 10. Look at verse 14 of chapter 10. It says, The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt, such a dense swarm of locusts as never had been before, nor ever will be again. 30 million is a lot of locusts. It's a lot of grasshoppers. We know this because of this text. It, doesn't, it pales in comparison to what is experienced here in Exodus chapter 10. This is an epic plague. Now, if this was an isolated event, it may be recoverable. But the impact of the plague was multiplied because of the previous carnage, devastation. Turn back a chapter, chapter 9, verse 22 of Exodus. Chapter 9, verse 22. It describes the previous damage from the plague of hail. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven. So there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field. In all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree. Now jump back to chapter 10, go to verse 15. We have a slight problem. Moses is talking about the plague of locusts. It says this, They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Wait, hail had left? Remember chapter 9, verse 25? How can there be plants left? Every plant of the field was struck down. How can that be? Where do the extra plants of the field come from? It's similar to actually another problem in the text. Chapter 9, verse 6, that says all the livestock are destroyed. And then more livestock are killed with hail in chapter 9, verse 19 and 25. And even more in chapter 12, which we'll be preaching on next week, chapter 12, verse 29. Have you guys thought of this dilemma in reading this? I actually didn't think of this until I was studying this passage. Thank you if you have, because then it makes me I'm not, not alone. Um, and if you listen to me preach, I tend to deal with some of these difficulties because I, I enjoy them and I think there's, there's a, re a resolution. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, but there's, there's some explanations. There's a variety of different explanations. But if we just read it to read it, or just check off a list. It doesn't do us any good. God wants to speak to us, and so I think it's good to go to our text and ask questions of it. What's going on here? What's being taught here? I don't think we have to worry. We need to read it closely. So I think there's several different answers. So let me give you three different possibilities. Maybe you've, you can come up with another one. I've read, I've read other ones, and maybe you, you have one that I've never read, and that's great. The pastors, we were, we were talking about this today, how do you reconcile this? One thought is maybe the ancient understanding of all and every is different. Maybe their understanding is different than ours. During this week, one of my children spilled water on the floor. And what do I say? You spilled water all over the floor. Was it all over the floor? It, it's different than if I talk to Doug Carlson who refinishes floors, hardwood floors. I say, Doug, could you refinish all with my hardwood floors? Well, that's a different use of the word all. So when I say all to Doug, and he hears all, he knows I mean all my hardwood floors. When my kids, when my kids who, who've spilled water all over the floors hear that, and, and I say that, they may be thinking of, there's, a, there's an emotional response to that. I think there's other explanations as well that I like. Um, because there is a dramatic, what, whether you embrace that explanation or not, there's a dramatic impact here. This is different than 30 million locusts hitting Egypt in 2013. This is categorically so bad that the servants in verse 7 are going to say, this is the ruin of Egypt. 
All these plagues are the ruin of Egypt. Pharaoh, do something. Don't let him send these locusts. And he does. And in verse 17, how does Pharaoh describe it? He, des he describes it as the death of him. This is something dramatic and different than just some kind of easy little basketball-sized puddle on, the, on my floor. Another explanation is the livestock as well as fields can be bought, stolen, and confiscated between each plague. We don't know the time between each plague. They can be bought, stolen, or confiscated. The Israelites don't experience these plagues. They have livestock. They, ha they have land that they've been working. Another possibility is that the, the livestock, not only could they could be replaced, but the plants could have grown back. I was talking in the beginning of June to Gary Ellert and uh, Larry Priest to attend here. We have farming in, in their background, and I noticed as I was, as I was uh, driving around that the hay was pretty tall, and I commented about it, and I said, yeah, it's actually late. It's actually a late uh, to, to have hay this tall and not be cut. I, I, I realized, really, it, it should be cut this, this early? And they said, yeah, we can actually get two cuttings. And I was talking to Larry yesterday at the work day, and he said, you can get four cuttings out of some hay. So it's possible within the time between plagues that it's grown back, and God's going to devastate it again. Regardless, we stand on the reliability of the text, the truthfulness of his word, and he's preserved it for us. And it's a unique revolution, or revelation. Turn my phone off. If you have phones, please turn them off at this time. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad that, remember the servants, their comment, and Pharaoh's his comment. It, it leads us to another question. Why? Why is it so bad? Why all this destruction? And I think the answer relates to the main point of the text. God is putting Egypt in its place. And Jeff has already talked about this. The seven other plagues are related to the other three that we're going to talk about today. The reason for the plagues is repeated some 13 times. What's the reason? What's the purpose? It's that the whole earth, the future generations, the Israelites, the Egyptians, Pharaoh, would know that God is God and there is no other. He is to be remembered throughout all generations and his name is to be proclaimed in all the earth. God is holy. That means he's separate and distinct. And he goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is. The Pharaoh didn't get this. He flippantly asked the question in chapter 5, verse 2, who is God? Who is the Lord? The Pharaoh doesn't care. But God is going to show him. God is going to make him care. God is holy and goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is. The Lord of Moses is Lord of all. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the only true God, ruler of the animal kingdom, and complete control of nature. He holds the keys to life and death, even Pharaoh. The ultimate ruler of the new empire of Egypt, one of the greatest civilizations known to man, is subservient to God. No court can thwart the almighty Yahweh. I am reigns over everything and everyone, and his word will endure forever. The Egyptians didn't know this. One commentator says they, have 80, they had 80-some different gods, major deities clustered about three great natural forces, the Nile, the land, the sky, and God is going to respond to all of them in his plagues. He reigns over every single little G god. In the pestilence of locusts, we discover that what Pharaoh is thinking in verse 3. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh refused to humble himself before God. He, he exalts himself and rejects God in chapter 9, verse 17. He's morally culpable and responsible for his insubordination to the creator of the universe and maker of us all. His prideful thinking is problematic. This type of thinking is problematic. God is holy and is going to go to great lengths to reveal whom he is. Now, it may not seem that, like, pride may not seem like that big of a deal, but here's what God's word says about pride. Proverbs 8.13 Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech, I, the Lord, hate. God hates pride. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. There's disgrace with pride. 
Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. There's destruction and a fall in pride. Proverbs 29, 23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. There's a bringing low with pride. Psalm 31, 23, the Lord preserves the faithful, but he abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. God will repay the one who acts in pride. Pride's a bad thing. It's pride's bad news. The opposite of pride is humility. Pharaoh is not humbling himself. He's not thinking in a humble way. He's thinking in a prideful way. What does the Bible say about humility? We've already mentioned two, Proverbs 11, 2, Proverbs 29, 33. With pride comes wisdom, or with humility comes wisdom. And God gives honor to the humble. In Proverbs 3, 4, it says, Towards the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. The Lord gives favor to the humble. In Isaiah 66, 2, it says, This is the one whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. God looks at the humble. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You want to know what God wants from you? He wants humility. And in James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. There's an exaltation in the humility. We must be a humble people. We must be humble before God. Pharaoh was not humble before God. What we think about ourselves matters. God is, will not stand competition. He alone is God. Now, Pharaoh probably grew up hearing something totally different. If you know the history of pharaohs, it said they're descendants of God, like Caesars and the uh, emperors of Japan before them, or after them. And that's a convenient proposition for a politician who wants control. Not only would you fear someone who has political power over you, but someone who has supernatural power, that's something to be feared. That's convenient. Now, he may not have thought this. He may have had his feet firmly on the ground, thinking about his own mortality. But such beliefs make sense why people would sacrifice themselves for the Pharaoh, why they would be buried alive in pyramids, why people would obey him to great lengths, and why his heart would be easily hardened. Friends, Pharaoh thought he was better than Moses. He thought he was better than this God, this foreign God. What Pharaoh thought about himself and what he thought about God matters. What we think about matters. And it raises a question in my mind. Is pride always bad? Is pride always bad? Now the verses that I've read seem to suggest that pride's really bad and humility's really good. But is it always bad? Is it bad to have pride in our nation? Pride in our state or city or school? How about pride in your kids? Pride in yourself. Self-esteem. Is self-esteem a sin or bad? Is it sin to tell my kids, I'm proud of you, son? Or to be proud to be an American? Let me muddy the waters a little bit more. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, Paul says, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, Corinthian people. He's proud of the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. And he's not apologetic. It's not a confessional. It's actually something that I think that is exemplary. I think it's different. It's categorically different than the pride that Paul's, or that, that's talked about in Exodus here. I think what Paul's doing is he's recognizing the sovereign grace, the grace and mercy of God at work within the Corinthian people to change them. They are conduits of God and his mercy and his, his um, divine attributes. It's an acknowledgement of, the, of them an acknowledgement of God as well, simultaneously. Pride like that is good. That's not what Pharaoh was thinking. It's not what God was saying to Pharaoh. We know this not because of just what he's thinking, but what he's speaking. See, out of our thoughts flow our words. Our words matter. Our words matter just like our thoughts. And it brings me to my second point, our speaking. God cares about what we say. Look back at chapter 10, verse 7 in your Bibles. It says this, Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? 
So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. We'll go with our sons and daughters, with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you if I ever let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No! Go the men among you, serve the Lord, for that's what you're asking. And they were driven out from the Pharaoh's presence. Words matter. The servants who were resistant in verse 2 cry mercy in verse 7. They saw the Egyptians, what the magicians had seen in chapter 8, verse 19. And out of their heart, their mouth spoke. They feared what God was going to bring next. How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? God was preparing the servants of Pharaoh to drive free labor. Their free labor, their, their only remaining natural resources away. God moves in mysterious ways. Maybe you can relate to that breaking point, that tipping point, that place where you cry mercy. God, you have me. And you, you're surrendered to him. The inner ring was surrender to give God what he's asking. He doesn't just do this to the world, but he does this to his children with loving discipline. He loves us so much that he disciplines us, he challenges us, he presses us. He won't give up on you. He wants you to surrender yourself to him. God is holy and goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is. He's not done revealing himself to Pharaoh. Look at Pharaoh's words. He caves. He caves to his servants in verse 8 and says, Go! But as soon as he learns that the bad news of the Hebrews are going to take their kids and the only remaining livestock in the country, Pharaoh guesses what they're up to. It's no good. And he's right in part. They're going to serve the Lord and leave forever. God's revealing to Pharaoh more of the plan. He didn't see this. But he's revealing more of the plan and he gets upset. God doesn't always reveal to us all of what's going to happen. In fact, most of the time, we only get a little bit, little bit of revelation before us, what's going to happen. And in verse 9, Pharaoh plays right in, into God's plan. His heart is hardened. He says, the Lord be with you if I ever let your little, you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. Evil purpose. What did Pharaoh say? You have some evil purpose. Isn't that ironic? What kind of evil is that? Where's Pharaoh's category of evil with the enslavement of some two million people? There are two million Israelites in Egypt at this time, and they're slaves. Isn't that evil? Where's evil in, Pharaoh, in Pharaoh's category of evil when he cheats Moses? Where's evil in regards to Pharaoh's predecessor calling for all male Israelite babies to die? Where do Pharaoh's morals come from? How does he define good, acceptable, and right? Is morality, is morality a function of a kingly decree or a democratic derivative? What if the monarchy or the majority desire something evil? What if they call evil good and good evil? Does it make it right, good, and acceptable? The governor of our behavior must not be a floating measure. The governor of our behavior must not be a floating measure. Evil in Pharaoh's mind, for him, it's defined by the loss to him personally of free labor and resources. But that's not how we define evil. No, we stand on God's word, his word alone. If anyone is committing evil, it's not Moses, but Pharaoh in his pompous arrogance. We know this. God is holy and goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is. Our words reflect our hearts. What we say matters. And Jesus says we will have to give account for every careless word we speak. All lying and gossiping, slandering, crude joking, quarreling, grumbling, complaining, every graceless and careless word. We will have to stand before the judge and give an account, Jesus says. And Pharaoh here is calling what is evil good and what is good what is evil? Pharaoh is not in a good place. He does not want God. He doesn't want God's ways. He wants his way. He wants his way today. Check out what he does, what he says next. Look in your Bibles at verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses, 
stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locust. The locust came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt with such a dense swarm of locusts as it had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants of the land and all the fruit of the trees and all the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither the tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I've sinned against the Lord your God, against you. Therefore, forgive me my sin. Please, only this once, plead for, with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. Here we see that God sends judgment on this proud king. God demonstrates his control over the land and sky and all living things. And what does Pharaoh say in response? He asks for forgiveness. He recognizes his sin. He asks for intercession. Those are, those are good things. Those are really good things. It's exactly what we'd hope for, right? We should, we should be all good, right? He gave an apology, made a confession, and asked for help. But what's behind those sweet words of an apology? Not all apologies are alike. Not all words mean the same thing. Let's look more closely at these words. Let's look at two things here. First, he limits his admission of guilt and need for forgiveness to this once. Here's the scope of how he sinned. It's just this one time. Is that all he sinned? Or is it broader than that? What was Pharaoh thinking? What was he speaking? What's going on in his heart? Another observation is look at the reasoning behind this. He sees the death of him, the ruin for him. The scope of his admission of guilt is self-motivated, looking at the consequence. It doesn't go beyond, it doesn't go beyond to the Egyptian slaves of the Israelite people. It doesn't go beyond his servants. It doesn't go to his country, his nation. He doesn't look at how this impacts God or honoring God. The scope is just, is just himself. Now, I don't want to be a po apology police. I don't want to be an, an apology police, policeman saying, you know what, my, my apologies are better. And I think if you're like me, you might relate better to Pharaoh than you do Moses. Our words are inadequate. We speak poorly. We overstate our case. Maybe you've said sorry just to get people off your back, to appease someone. How do we judge words? Sometimes it's hard to discern what people mean and want. Words can be right. You can have all the right words and your heart be not there. Maybe you've seen that. Ultimately, final judgment is before Jesus. He's the final judge and says we are not to judge ultimately. We can discern, we can judge, we can assess, but not ultimately. It's God's place. And we can deceive ourselves in countless ways. Let's be gracious in our assessment of one another. Let's assume the best of one another. But it's good to assess ourselves, to be critical about ourselves, our words, our apologies to our spouses, and children, and parents, and family, church friends, work friends, neighbors. How do we test an apology? Our way to assess brings me to my last point, our doing. We talked about our, our thinking, our speaking, and our doing. Jesus said a tree will be known by its fruits. If Pharaoh's words were unclear, his actions make it plain. My third point is our doing. What does Pharaoh do after Moses pleads for him to God? Well, Pharaoh's heart's hardened, and in verse 20, he did not let the people go. It's actually what he didn't do. He didn't let the people go. The tree is known. The Pharaoh rejects God's rules. We see the, what the apology is. In the past year, we've had a few public and private apologies as elders and leaders in November of last year, the elders asked forgiveness from you for being agenda-driven and putting tasks over shepherding people, putting tasks over people. This played out in private meetings, but it had a broader impact on the body of Christ. How do we judge apologies? 
As I've personally observed and participated in increasing measure the last three years, I've seen our conflicts have changed us and sharpened us and helped us. God, I believe, has, loves us so much that he disciplines us. So the elders, what are we doing? I see more prayer, more praying. We take the membership list, if you're a member here, and we pray for you. We love you. We're working through a book on what does God's word say we are to do as elders. We're stopping our agenda when someone's hurting. We're praying for them. When we know something's happening in the body, we're praying for that. And when we have a big decision, when we, we look at youth ministry, for example, we're not telling you what the decision is. We're asking you to pray, to join us in praying and listen to what God would have us say or God would have us do, and then speaking and talking about that. There's a significant, in my perspective, there's a significant change in repentance. We're not perfect. We're not perfect, but we're surrendered to God. Now, Pharaoh changed. Pharaoh had fruit, but the fruit was bad. His change was for the worse. His heart grew hard, and he was not surrendered and obedient to God. So what does God do? Remember, legend has it, Pharaoh is the descendant of a god. Re, the sun god, the father of all gods, creator. And what does God do? The next plague is a plague of darkness over that sun god. God is going to shut down the polytheistic lies. The sun itself will bow to Yahweh, the father and king of all Egyptian gods, is no match to the true God, the true creator of the universe. Pharaoh tries to set the terms, set the terms of conditions for Israel and, and God, and God would have none of it. God is looking for unconditional surrender. God is holy and goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is. So, so what does Pharaoh do? He kicks Moses out. Speaking one last ironic th threat in verse 28. Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses, leaving in chapter 11, communicates a turning of tables, declaring Pharaoh's right. Pharaoh is right in part. Death would come, but not to Moses, but to Pharaoh's people. Not to Moses' people, but to Pharaoh's people, and, and Pharaoh's people, Pharaoh's animals, in Pharaoh's home as well. And in three chapters, Moses will be standing, Pharaoh will be drowning, and death shall come to Pharaoh. Pharaoh shall die. Death's a hard reality. What does it teach us? I think it reminds us of who God is and who we are. We, what we think and what we speak and what we do matters. God is holy and goes to great lengths to reveal whom he is, and God will be known for who he is. Those who say God is dead, die. God is alive and death ultimately is defeated. The gods of the ancient worlds like Ray, the sun god, have no control over the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the Israelites. God brings light to the people and darkness for judgment. I think far too often we live our lives within our own little walls. We think about what, what the world's doing to us and how it affects us and how it impacts us. We don't think about God as much as we should. We don't speak about God as much as we should. We don't live for God as much as we should. Let me conclude with this word. With this judgment and death, darkness, comes a future of light and life and redemption, freedom and forgiveness and hope. God is a redeemer and redeeming a people for himself who would become his property, not Pharaoh's. They are bought, conquering, this idolatrous people with a landslide victory. And the prophet Isaiah gives us this word. I think it fits in chapter 45. In chapter 45, verse 22 and following, it says, Turn to me. Turn to me, all the ends of the earth. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Do you pledge allegiance to God? Do you pledge allegiance to God? Is he your God? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord today? Do you want to be God's people? Do you want to be saved? Maybe this is new. Maybe you're thinking, ah, this is different. This is new. I do want those things. Well, how do I appropriate that? How do I get that? You could say, sorry, thank you, please. Sorry for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for them. 
Please help me live for you. Help me turn to live for you. Sorry. Thank you. And please, unconditionally surrendering yourself to him and his ways. God is calling you to repent and believe and to surrender and obey. He is on the throne in control of creation, all animals, all bacteria, water and storms, life and death. We must humble ourselves and recognize whom he is. He is sovereign. Men, women, young and old, we will have to give an account before the creator and maker of us all for all our speaking, thinking, and doing. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And either we do that now in practice, or as a rebel, we, we pay the rebel's reward in heaven or on judgment. Choose you this day who you will serve, who will you worship, who will you love, who will you obey. Please, for your freedom, for your joy, and for your salvation. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you reveal who you are and that we don't have to experience the plague of locusts to see who you are as Pharaoh did. We don't have to face the, the harsh hand of God upon a, a prideful heart as Pharaoh did. We can see you through the pages of Scripture, and I pray that you would show us who you are more clearly as we continue to meditate, and consider, to ponder, and reflect. And even as we sing, I pray that you would impress upon us your greatness, your holiness, your majesty. And may we turn and walk away from a life lived for self, a life lived in pride, and embrace, humbly embrace your lordship over our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.